Perfect. So welcome everyone to our first Florida Young Birders Club meeting. Um, I'm Blair Clark. I'm one of the, uh, what would you call it? One of the starting members of this club and super excited to have everyone here today. We are going to be talking about um, native swamp and rookery at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoological Park. Um, and today we have Jen Anderson coming to talk to us. Um, Jen has been the curator of the alligator farm um, since 2014, overseeing the reptile education, bird and mammal departments for that. She was a zookeeper and then the curator of the bird and mammal department. Um, and Jen has been involved in a ton of different projects. Um, one of the biggest one is the US Fish and Wildlife um, Wood Sort Recovery Group Team. So, be really good and excited to have you today, Jen. If you'd like to start sharing your presentation, that'd be great. Let's see. Hey Blair, thank you for having me. I appreciate this. So let me get to my presentation here. Are you able to see it? Yeah, yes. Okay, wonderful. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the native swamp and rookery that we have at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm. So I'm gonna run through it like you've never seen it before. Um, and this is just kind of a very simple description I'm gonna talk about. And of course, I'm happy to answer questions at the end, but I can honestly talk about the rookery for hours if I had to easily without repeating much information. So a little general history about the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoological Park. We officially opened in 1893, of course, before any of us were born, a long time ago. It is one of the original uh, animal holding facilities, I guess you would say, in the country, or one of the original zoos. And we started off as a collection of nuisance alligators. It has been accredited by the AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums since 1989. The AZA is considered the gold standard of animal well-being and handling uh, uh, facilities around the world, though there are thousands and thousands of animal facilities and sanctuaries and zoos in the country. Only about 230 or so are accredited by the AZA. So it's it's a big deal. We get accredited every five years. We have never been a farm. It's never in the history of the alligator farm have alligators ever been harvested for meat. It's just an old name. And currently we are well known for our crocodilian collection and we have 24 species of crocodilians. Our park used to be able to advertise that um, we had every species of known crocodilians when there were 21 and when there was 23. And now we have 24 species, but scientists scientifically described there are, I think there will soon be 27 species. And it's just like with birds. So it's not like new species of birds are showing up every year. They're just using uh, genetic work to determine that these are actually two different sp subspecies of an animal versus two different, I'm sorry, two different species versus two different subspecies. But it's because of this large collection of crocodilians that our rookery is successful and exists over the park. So I'll go into detail about that in a little bit. We have our primary area for the nesting birds and it's the two acre swamp. Mostly all American alligators are in this swamp and um, American crocodiles, or we have one American crocodile in there right now, but it's got this nice winding boardwalk. And so it makes it really easy to view all of the wading birds when they come to nest every spring. They usually show up in decent numbers beginning around Valentine's day. So that's when I tell people that the rookery season starts. But in previous years, we've had especially roseate spoonbills coming before then, showing up as early as mid-January, when there's not a single leaf on most of the trees that are out in the swamp. And then you just see this hot pink um, bird flying around uh, looking for nesting material. So that's pretty great to see. So this is just a couple of vantage points. And you can see there's a bunch of alligators hanging out underneath the shrubbery. 
and this is looking to the south. So it's a really nice winding boardwalk. That's L shape, lots of vantage points. The St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoological Park is also a member of the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail. So there's hundreds and hundreds of sites and you have to apply to be one of these birding or wildlife sites, they call it now. And it's a place to go and see, have excellent experiences and almost guaranteed to see wildlife because these, these sites are, they, they build it and they will come kind of thing. So they make sure that everything is done for that facility or to attract the wild birds and other wildlife. And there's usually a lot of educational opportunities and school groups, things like that going through. So if you're ever, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with this, but if you're looking to find some new locations to go birding, in the state of Florida, it's easy. Just look on their website and they have regional maps and you can click on your county or neighboring counties or an area you're planning to go visit on a little weekend vacation and you can find a new place to go and you know that it's gonna be somewhere that's known for bird watching. So we have the two acre swamp, but then the birds of the last few years, especially since hurricanes Matthew in 2016 and hurricane Irma in 2017, we lost some really large, significant trees out in the swamp. We have planted numerous other ones, but they don't grow as fast as we'd like them to. And so some of the birds have taken to nesting in other locations around the zoo. Uh, pros and cons to that. But as a whole, there are eight primary nesting wading bird species that we, we monitor. There are at least 12 different species that roost on a regular basis, but we have other species that show up intermittently or they show up and we never even see them because they're just spending the night as they pass through. Um, and we have anywhere between 400 and up to 800 nests of wading bird species per year. It definitely varies every year, just and that's very normal for wading bird rookeries. So they're very cyclical depending on resources the water table depth, you know, prey availability. And so that does fluctuate year to year. But in the, 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 the long time I've been there, we only once had under 400 nests and it was like 396 nests. So 600 nests or so is a pretty average year. On the years that we've had banner years for almost 800 nests, that's when we've had a couple hundred cattle egret nests. So we don't necessarily want a couple hundred cattle egret nests because they've already taken over the world. We'd much rather uh, other birds have that space to, especially species of special concern in Florida, such as tricolored herons and little blue herons are now uh, being more closely monitored, monitored by Florida Fish and Wildlife. And we do have thousands of birds roosting overnight, every single night in the rookery year round. We like it when it rains. So can you see my cursor if I put it over? Probably not. Yeah, okay, we so, see, we okay, see. great. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking see. about quizzing the kid, uh, the, the birders, but these are pretty easy species, I feel like. But then again, I've been staring at them for a long time, so I'm very familiar. So these are the species that nest regularly that we monitor. So there's the little blue heron. Of course, in the middle here, we have great egrets, top right, the tricolored heron. Then we have, of course, the very popular, easy to identify, the flamingo, just kidding, roseate spoonbill, snowy egret in the middle, cattle egret here in full breeding plumage, even though these other species are as well. Oops, sorry. Uh, and then the wood stork, the only stork in the United States. And then bottom right is the green heron. Now the green heron is a very solitary nester for the most part and has pretty secretive nests far away from most of the other wading bird nests. And usually the numbers are very low. We may, I think the highest we've ever had in one year is five nests. Um, and this past year we had zero nests though there were some adults around and they, it was suspected there was nests but I never found offspring the entire year. Um, some birds that roost there, but rarely nest, but can be seen on occasion doing so. This top left, we have the yellow crowned night heron, just hangs out in the winter, along with the black crowned night heron. So those two species, I'm sorry, this is the black crown, this is the yellow crown. These two hang out 
during the winter when the rookery season is not going on. Once all that chaos starts, they're out. So they go and nest elsewhere. Top right, we have the great blue heron. We have a few of those and quite often people comment about why they aren't nesting, but I'm fine that they're not nesting in our rookery because then they would uh, use the other nesting birds as snacks for their offspring. So that would, um, it would teach a lot of people about the cycle of life, but since we have so many alligators, we see that already plenty enough. <laughs> um, bottom left, we have the white ibis. So this is a juvenile white ibis and we've had a couple um, of years recently where they have nested in very small numbers in our rookery, but they're the ones that roost during the winter. I mean, roost at nighttime for in hundreds of birds, hundreds and hundreds of white ibis nest there, uh, roost there at night. So we don't necessarily need them to nest there as well. And then we have the anhinga. I just think they're super cool. So I just tossed them in here, even though they're not really relevant to the population, the, to the, to the program, but they are neat to see, and it's really great watching them with their giant web feet clunk around in the trees awkwardly. Then we have some birds that sometimes people think are um, a new species, or they get super excited about it, and they blow it up on social media, or just things that are a little bit more unusual to see out in our swamp area. So top left, most of you may be familiar with this, but this is the little blue heron. They start out as with white plumage and in a couple years is when they finally acquire that solid steel bluish gray plumage. But in between they get all spotted and mottled and, and they look great. And we have had birds nesting with this color coloration of plumage, but those nests are not always successful. Um, top right, you have here a dancing reddish egret. We have seen them at night sometimes roosting, but it's very rare. I don't think we've ever seen them during the day and they definitely don't nest. We are the far northern, northern limit for their range. So it's more, I think they just caught a, a wind going the wrong direction and they just head back south shortly thereafter. Bottom left is glossy ibis. We've seen those sometimes also roosting at, net, at night. Um, there have been white-faced ibis in the area, so it could be that could be either species. I've never seen them myself. I've just been told that they have been. Uh, and bottom right is an abnormal plumage for a cattle egret in breeding plumage. So yes, they get that peach color to them, but not so extensively as you see here. And cattle egrets that are like this, photographers get really excited about, birders get really excited about, and they usually dub them with the name peaches. Now there is a life lesson of the cycle of light. So in the wild, our zoo is not wild of course, but in the wild wading birds typically will congregate their rookeries over larger groups of alligators, at least here in Florida. So alligators are our primary water predator. They're eating the things that that really predate on wading bird young. So tree climbing predators, your raccoons, possums, snakes even, feral cats, things that are climbing up into the trees and grabbing those young. Yes, there could be things like great horned owls or even crows, uh, but those usually don't decimate an entire rookery like some mam mammalian predators can. So the most secure location for a wading bird rookery is on an island. And then you have the alligators that are circling around the island. They're keeping all of that algae from matting up. They're keeping it nice and clear. It makes it harder for things to swim across. If things try to swim, they're getting grabbed first by say the alligator. So they have a much higher survival rate of their young and they have then a really good successful fledging rate in the wading bird rookery. So our zoo replicates that unintentionally. So when they first started making more habitats for crocodilians and alligators with these big trees above it, suddenly the wading birds started coming in. And I, no one knows when they first started. I do know that the swamp was expanded, uh, constructed, basically just fenced in in the 1970s at some point, but that the wading bird rookery did exist prior to that expansion. And once they built that though, definitely the wading bird rookery number of inhabitants grew up exponentially and there was a lot more birds that would come. 
So now we just always try to continue to provide that habitat and look for the future by providing more trees or future sized trees of species that the birds like to nest in and keep trying to continue to expand upon the habitat for the wild birds as well. Um, but it's not all fun and games for, for the nesting birds either when there's other predators such as alligators around. And so they do lose some of their young sometimes to alligators. It's kind of the, I guess the smartest don't survive or some of the weak chicks that get evicted from their nest get kicked out. And then the alligators actually get a reward for protecting them from the raccoons by getting one of their weak chicks. Some species, especially like the great egrets on the bottom right, I'm not sure if you can really see that, but the parents um, per, do infocide and the siblings do siblicide where if there's a weak one in the nest, they will take turns kind of beating it out and evicting it from the situation. And that way the strongest do survive. It's, it's a kind of a rough life out there, but the ones that make it um, hopefully will produce more in the future. So to have though, say imagine 800 nests where you have two to four chicks hatch out from each nest. You have a pair, an adult pair for each nest. That is a lot of birds and it's hard on the trees. They're, all their guana that they produce is really acidic and it elevates the pH of the soil and makes it really toxic for the trees. And also it can compact the soil and just so it, soil needs to be aerated in the swamps. We have to keep uh, planting more trees to be able to handle that. Typically here in St. Augustine, when the, it, the rookery season is in full force, it's kind of our dry season. So there's not a lot of rain going on. So, and there's just a whole lot of cleanup. We're a zoo open to the public and there's hundreds and hundreds, nearly thousands of birds defecating and pooping all over the place. And um, people don't really like that. And it hits the guests and we just tell them it's good luck. Um, but it's part of the experience, I like to say. But there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And we have the alligators in there as well. So that makes it tricky certain times of the year. Um, they're in constant feeding response when there's lots of chicks falling out of nests so it's not safe for staff to walk through there regularly. And um, also if we're walking through there, it'll flush the chicks out of the nest. So there's there's almost half the year that we rarely go out into the swamp because it's both not the safest situation and we would put to risk some of these wading bird species that we really want to be successful and we don't want to hinder that. And then also when the alligators go into nesting mode, they're extremely territorial. So logistically it gets a little tricky, but there's lots of cleanup every single morning by the maintenance crew. And there's other things that we do though to try to encourage people to come see our rookery and to say, hey, this is what we have to offer. All you have to do is walk through this and see wildlife that you rarely see so close up and it's such numbers. And so by being the manager of this rookery, I spent a lot of time trying to share information um, readily so I don't have to repeat myself all the time. So I have a rookery blog, we have rook rookery brochures, we have lots of graphics signs along the swamp for people to read. Um, I also do a rookery hotline that people can call and, and learn more about what's going on as well. Um, we have a huge number of photographers that come. So it's not just bird watchers, but photographers that want to get pictures of baby birds up close. They, they can't go do that at many other parks because they just can't get that close. And our birds are very habituated they probably hatched out there and their parents hatched out there. Typically with wading birds, they tend to return to the rookery that they hatched or a very close by one. And we know that's true sometimes by leg bands and recites, but there's a lot of times we don't know. So we just kind of go assume by that, but you can also tell by the behavior, the fact that some of these birds are nesting within literally arm's reach of people walking by. They they're just used to it. They were born to that and it's for them, it's no big deal, um, even though they are all wild birds. We have uh, colleges and high school ecology, biology type classes that come through and we do different lessons for them related to migration, um, 
just AV and history, just all sorts of things, whatever they're interested in. And we can take our rookery and tweak it to an educational experience. Of course, we have lots of bird watchers come through. They may not necessarily want to go to the zoo, but they'll be there and they'll get to experience some of what we have to offer on that side of things and then come and stare at the rookery all the time. We have art classes that come through and just sit stationary and, and paint what they're seeing. And of course, we have lots of school groups come through. So there's lots of educational opportunities that way. And this is an old graphic, but um, I just really like it that <laughs> the birds trying to learn a little bit more about uh, <laughs> snowing egrets. Um, and it's gonna show you that it's habituated to the public. This bird is just landing. Um, the kids just as surprised as the bird, but then they just kind of will turn around and they're, they're regularly always sitting along the posts and are fencing the boardwalk. It's a very spot, popular spot, like I mentioned, for nat nature photographers. So what you're seeing in this image is you'll have a lot of photographers just lined up all along the boardwalk, and then you have the guests coming through as well. We do offer a special photographer's pass, and they get to come in early before the park opens to normal zoo guests. They get to come in an hour early, and then they get to stay at the end of the day for two to three hours. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, two to three hours afterwards, when the sun is just right and it's you don't have a bunch of people running on the boardwalk or strollers going across too. So um, it's a great added benefits. And that runs from March through July usually. And here's some signs I had made this year. And what's funny is we hang these up. I mean, a whole bunch that have just little loops and you can just kind of hang them wherever there seems to be a, a nest constructed and kind of maybe not the best spot for um, people passing by and usually these signs are just covered in poop and uh, people will be standing there right there next to them looking at the sign and not even realizing what's going on but some birds like I would imagine like a warbler has a very tiny little perfect little defecation and then but a, a wading bird that's eating a lot of fish and crustaceans it's a big stinky mess it's it's pretty great. Um, so here's the brochures that are given out when people come through and on the back of it, it has kind of the typical rookery schedule. People want to know, hey, what species can I see hatching when? When can I see nesting displays or courtship displays? And when, when can I see incubation or all these different kind of things? So it's like spelt out really short and sweet. Spoonbills start showing up great egrets are next to arrive and they're strutting their egrets all over the place. You know, it's, it's kind of like laid out like that. Uh, and this information is also readily available on the Rookery blog. And Blair, I'm not sure if this is something you want to pull up the Rookery blog and I can also do it at the end and share the link. So there's definitely a few years worth of information here. And it, I have end of season counts. I haven't done the end of season for this year yet because I just got all the final information actually just in, in time for this presentation. Um, but there's natural history for certain species, uh, what we've done during storms, uh, photo contest winners that include a lot of rookery shots. So there's a whole bunch of information uh, on this blog. And so what's great here is you have the spoonbill graphic and then you have nesting spoonbills right there. One thing I didn't share on here is we also have a rookery cam that's through explore.org. And some of you may have been on explore.org before. It's also, they have a YouTube channel and you can just go and see cameras. You can see cameras of fish tanks that are just live streaming. You can see them of like sheep herding, which is always really fascinating. And there's of course, tons and tons of of bird nests. And so we have one, it's called the alligator and spoonbill cam. And you can find it on the bird tab under spoonbills. And during the nesting season, it's a nice 360 degree, well, maybe it's like 270 degree rotational camera that zooms around on different nests nearby. And actually the, the camera is pretty close to this one. So it zooms in on different nests and you can sit there and you can watch a nest for a couple hours until maybe the lighting changes or something else is going on and then the camera gets moved to a different nest. So it, it's pretty, it's a pretty neat camera. So that's explore.org also on YouTube. Um, so this looks kind of a little dim to me, but this is 
around 2007, we started getting much better data consistently in our rookery. We did start around 2000 or a little bit before that. That was, I was not as involved with that way back then, but it does go up and down. You can see the seasonal fluctuation and where we have 400 to 800 nests. So this right now goes up to 2020. For the last couple of years, there was a slight dip in total nests. Um, but like this past season, we had about 550 or so nests. So it's still pretty close to nice average year if you want to count 600 nests as average. It was a little bit low. And there were some things that were unusual about this past year that we were never able to really confirm. But if any of you have heard about highly pathogenic avian influenza, it was basically like the COVID of the bird world this year. And it typically was not affecting wading birds. It started off with waterfowl. And then here in Florida, it really greatly affected raptors, especially black vultures. Um, but there was at least one case of a wading bird in Florida. And so we were a little concerned early on in the nesting season our numbers weren't as great. There was some failures of nests that we normally wouldn't see, but any of the birds that passed that we submitted for avian influenza tested negative. Um, so we're not really sure what happened there. It could have had to do with whatever the food source was at the time, but a lot of the nest failures were before the chicks even hatched out of the eggs, just that eggs failed to hatch or from our perspective, we couldn't necessarily see in the nest, but maybe the eggs hatched and the, die, the, egg, the chicks died right away. So we're not really sure. Um, so it's all just kind of assuming at this time what happened this year, but overall we still have lots of nests. So just not necessarily the most successful fledgling rate. Because we are not counting the eggs in each nest, we don't have a true fledging rate, which is how researchers were really determine how successful a rookery is. But um, we've been doing this for a long time and it was definitely a pretty good year. It just took a little while to get going. So it's, we do a lot of conservation uh, work at our zoo, but this one is great because it's local and I literally just need to walk out of my office and just to right around the corner at part of the zoo and do some conservation work, nice and local, super local. I don't even have to get in my car. And there's a team of people to help. And the data that we collect is extremely important and it's used by US Fish and Wildlife. Every year I submit data to them. I submit it to Florida Fish and Wildlife, which is FWC, and then Audubon in Florida. So each of these three organizations is interested in different aspects of the data. And then I usually also have some different uh, university researchers that are looking for some gamut of that. Like, hey, we're looking for dietary information or this or that. And so we've participated in a lot of those studies as well, just providing data or samples even, uh, depending on what they're looking for. And so this was every year we have a rookery crew and they're out nearly weekly, pretty much for, from March through late June to early July, and they are out there counting. And it's not so difficult at the beginning, but once it's peak season like May, there's tons of nests and they're all over each other, all screaming. There's tons of chicks everywhere and it gets really chaotic. And by that time it's summer crowds and it's gotten pretty warm. So they come in early with the photographers even earlier if possible, and they can get in and out in an hour early on. Later on in the year, um, it gets a little more difficult. So every week though, our rookery crew is counting the species that are really, um, really closely being monitored by these different conservation partners. So US Fish and Wildlife manages the wood storks. So we count them once a week. So we have really detailed data to provide to them. Roseate spoonbills are kind of a keystone species here in Florida, and they're failing in many locations throughout the state. So Audubon of Florida is really looking for some detailed information regarding them. And they're actually one of the reasons we have our explore.org camera now. And so we count them weekly. And until this year, we were counting green heron nests weekly only because of some construction that we had done and we were wanting to make sure that we were not hindering 
those uh, nesting species. So I did say that green herons had zero nesting this year, but I'm blaming it all on tricolored herons and little blue herons this year taking over their previous nesting areas. But without the rookery crew, it would be very difficult for me to acquire this information every, every week. Once a month, we count every species, um, nests, adults, and chicks. And so we did that three times this year. So we do it, uh, I think we did uh, March, April, May. And so that gives us a big snapshot of everything else. And if any of our conservation partners want to know more about a certain species one year, then we would add them onto the weekly count. But at this time, the data we're collecting on a monthly basis for some of those other species is sufficient. Excuse me. So this is uh, one of the data collection sheets. Super old school tallies. Works really great. It's really boring. That's why I put some other stickers on it. But it works. And we have it broken down to these different areas, mostly because it helps with tallying. Um, there's been some years, I think we did it for three years in a row, where we also tallied what tree species they were nesting in. So even though I can say, okay, well, I always see this species nesting in these trees, but we wanted some written down documentation, actually legitimate data. And so we did that for a few years and it, it just helps select what tree species we're gonna provide out there in the future for, for, for future nesting. Um, so as a member of the US Fish and Wildlife Woodstork Recovery Plan, I am on that a steering committee or part of the members and it's people and different conservation organizations throughout Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, which is, uh, they are also nesting out towards Texas, but at this time there was no one on the US Fish and Wildlife Woodstork Recovery Plan, but that's thought to be a different subspecies of woodstorks, excuse me. <coughs> but globally, woodstorks are a species of least concern. Here in Florida, or here, I'm sorry, here in the United States, they were a federally protected by the Endangered Species Act and listed as an endangered species. Um, and that was for a long time and they weren't doing so well with humans, but they have since figured out how to coexist with humans. They've adapted and now they're expand, expanding their nesting range as some habitat areas get destroyed. And they have really learned to, to coexist without with it around people. There's also been a tons of regulations related to them and neighborhood construction and just construction in general that actually benefits them. And so a few years ago, they were downlisted from endangered to threatened. So there's still lots of protections for them, but what, what was the impetus or the reason that they made them threatened species federally instead of endangered is they needed to have 10,000 breeding pairs consistently nesting. And so every year, twice a year, we, the recovery group would get together. We would talk about our numbers. We would talk about what was affecting the populations in our different regions and what was benefiting them to figure out, okay, how can we help regulations work with the species, encourage the species to thrive? And um, after years and years, it just kept going up and up and up. And finally, it kind of stabilized. And there was a consistent pattern that I think that this species can be downlisted in the United States. But it's so great because we're one of the only rookeries in Northeast Florida for this species. There's a, one at Jacksonville Zoo and one other one in Jacksonville. And those are that's it. So everyone that's in the Northeast Florida region, at least around here, you get used to seeing wood storks up in the sky, but it's actually not a normal thing. They just um, thrive well in this region. So in 2014 is when they were downlisted to threatened. It's been a little while now. I just like this picture. So this is uh, multiple pairs. They're very snuggly. They are always just kind of all wrapped up around each other and, and preening each other and just, they're very fluffy. They're these are the very tree top, the tops of the trees and the nests will be almost like laying on top of each other. They, they play well with others unlike some of the other species like snowy egrets that just fight with everyone all the time. And this is, I think they're beautiful. A lot of people do not think wood storks are beautiful. I think they're gorgeous. They have that great bald head um, and their babies just sound like crying babies. They're like, wah, wah, wah. You could just, I could always tell when they're hatched before I can even see them, just hearing them in those 
way up high in the treetops. It's just much quieter when they're little. Um, and so this is wood stork uh, number of nests over since 2000, let's see, 2007 until this, this, this year. We did have a big drop this year, um, but they were one of the species that, I, that we kind of were noticing that some nests were abandoned or entire trees had been abandoned. Um, a couple of them, I just due to the location, I suspected predators. Um, we never saw the confirmation, but that's typically why wood storks will abandon a whole section of a tree is because a predator has come and interfered with what they had going on. But overall, we still have a really nice peak is around 100 nests, which is a lot of wood storks and a lot of fecal output, um, but they do really well. And so I think we peaked around 86 this year. So still a really good number. Um, there's been a couple years that we've banded wood stork chicks. So you can see this one's got a little leg band. Um, one of the birds out of this nest, I think it's actually this one you can see if that says 101, spends a lot of time at the Volano beach ramp um, stealing fishermen's bait. I get reports on that bird a lot. So I'm not really keen about that, um, but it is kind of nice to know that he, he or she is doing well. It is difficult for us to ban wood storks because they do nest at the very tops of the trees and it's not, they're not easily accessible for us to get. There was a couple location where nests were a little bit easier over the years, but at this point, that's not the case. Spoonbills are another really big conservation uh, species we work with conservationally. Um, and this is all through Audubon of Florida. And since they first started nesting in 2010, there were four nests that year. They definitely have decided they really like the St. Augustine alligator farm. And we love having the spoonbills around. People just think they're the most magnificent things. And like I kind of teased earlier, a lot of visitors think that they're flamingos, but regardless, they get their people's attention. And once, even if they say they're flamingos, it does open the door for conversation and educating people because they're just fan fantastic to have around. Um, but in general, they've done very well. And for the most part, their numbers have increased every single year. With the wood storks, they've kind of stabilized or plateaued. They need such big, sturdy trees to build their big nests. And we're on an island and trees don't grow that big. They're always kind of, even the big trees are still pretty scrubby compared to the size trees really can get like globally. Spoonbills are much smaller and lighter, build smaller nests. And so they can have, there's a lot more nesting spaces available for them versus the big gangly wood storks. Um, we participate in the wood stork banding project. So we started that a couple years after they started nesting. Wood storks, I'm sorry, spoonbills were nest, are banded by Audubon of Florida, uh, primarily in the Florida Bay down in Miami and over in Tampa. Uh, lots of birds were banded when they first started doing bird leg bands on spoonbills. But South Florida nests, they haven't banded in years and years because there has been so little spoonbill nesting successfully in areas that are even close to being remotely accessible. And even the ones that are nesting um, are in such small numbers that it's not, it's too risky for researchers to go and try to ban the chicks. And instead, if something goes wrong, then there's just so little nesting already going on. They don't want to interfere with that. Um, cause there is a little bit of risk to it, even though we do the best that we can and making sure that everything's successful. The amount of research and information we can gather from something as simple as leg bands is astronomical and really a great thing to have, but, um, you are getting wild animals and doing something to them, even if it's really, so there is some risk to that. Um, we haven't had any issues in all the years we've been banding. We don't band in huge numbers though, either in Tampa Bay, there was years and years where there were tons of spoonbills being banded. But from what I understand with that program, they just haven't had the financial resources and the staff time to be able to do that. And a lot of the spoonbill nesting locations, I think are over in neighborhoods. And so there's kind of some logistics that make it difficult. And it's a species that's protected in Florida. Um, so this is one of our graphics. So actually I noticed um, the person that 
Karen is a great photographer and she has really been helpful and instrumental with some of our photography work that we've had involving all of the leg band work that we've done with Rosie at Spoonbills. And so uh, you can see on the bottom right, this was one year we did all the ends and then we kind of have series where like this year, okay, I have all these leg bands. Okay, this is gonna be the year of the ends and I pull out all the leg bands that have ends on it. And we may band, I think big years, we probably banded uh, not even two dozen birds. So it's, it makes it pretty easy. Or this year, we're just gonna do all numbers or this year there's gonna be a Y in everything. Try to have a theme in theory so it helps us remember what year we did what leg band, but writing it down is easier to remember. But this is all through, once again, Audubon in Florida. They provide us with all the leg bands, these PVC ones, which we actually purchase for them to use in Florida, but then they provide us to them. The metal bands are through the USGS and those go on the opposite leg. So this red aluminum band at the very top, 7W, was one of the ones that was, the bands tend to be color coded as it is with most bird species throughout the, the country. So these red bands were all placed in the Tampa Bay area at numerous rookeries. And the thing is though, these are aluminum bands and they faded really bad. So it'd be really hard. One, the red color would come off and then you really couldn't see the number and it got really difficult. And so they now use PVC bands, which are really bright and really easy to read um, versus the amount of times I've just stared at spotting scopes for, there was one bird I stared at for almost two hours. I was like, I know this is a bird that has never been respotted before and, or at least here at the alligator farm. And I'm gonna stare at this thing until I could read its leg, but they sleep forever. They'll sit and they'll be roosting with the one leg up for like hours and you're just waiting and waiting. Um, but it, it is worth it, even the neck crick. So you can see here it is the aluminum band on the upper portion of the left leg. And then you have the USG band down below. With wading bird species, it's very normal to put the band above this hawk quote unquote knee, um, because when they're wading in the water and shallow water, you can still identify the leg band or still read the code. Helpful for recites, as you can see here. Because most of the time the spoonbills are just gonna be in a very shallow area. They're not swimming around at all like a duck. So you can still see some of these bands. Now this band is a black band. So that's from the Florida Bay area, but as you can see, it's barely black anymore. And the letters that were on it were that gray color. So now you can imagine how it's not possible to do a true recite on this bird anymore, unless you could read the USGS band. And the chances of that are, unless that bird is in hand, um, are pretty much slim to none. EB was one of our first birds. This was a bird that was banded in, I don't know exactly how to say it, Al Alafia Banks. So that's over in the Tampa Bay area. Um, EB first started showing up shortly afterwards. There was a series of tropical storms and hurricanes in 2005 that kind of blew a bunch of birds, we think, across the state. And we had a bunch of red banded birds show up that following kind of fall and winter in 2005. So not only EB, but a bunch of other birds. But EB showed up every year. Every year he came back to hang out for the wintertime with all the other juveniles. And then suddenly one year he showed up in April instead of in the fall for the first time. We're like, what's going on? Why is he here in April? Like he, usually they come for a couple months in the winter, hang out with their buddies and then go, let's go to wherever, South Florida for a little while. But he came back in April in full breeding plumage and nested that very first year. And that was the very first year Spoonbills nested at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm in 2010. We had four nests and EB produced four young that year. So here, here he is, we know he's a he. Um, feeding one of the offspring. For those of you that are not familiar with Rosie at Spoonville, as you can see this, even the chicks are pink, but it's a very, very pale pink. And it takes about three years before they reach this really bright color. And they get this, they call it carmine, but this hot pink stripe on their sides for when they're in their adult plumage going into a breeding season. <clears throat> so EB has nested almost every single year at the rookery, there was one year he never showed up, made us very nervous, and then he came back for a couple of years, but EB has not been spotted um, nesting at the alligator farm in the last few years. So hopefully he's found somewhere else 
to go. Um, that's what we like to think. Here's a close up on those PVC bands. They're brilliant. And we actually switched this year. Um, I only banded one chick this year because of avian influenza risk, but our colors are now red with white text. So it's Valentine's Day birds for sure, pink and red everywhere. Um, but it is risky. So whenever we need to go in there uh, to, to collect the chicks out of the nest, some of the locations aren't as readily accessible um, or there's just some buddies that want to come see what we're doing. Uh, so it, it takes a team. I can't just go in there and grab a chick and have a zookeeper help me band it and put it right back. It's a, it's a process. We do it very quickly. And I definitely earmark which trees are going to be nested by where the nests are located. Can I easily get up in a ladder? Is it something overhanging the boardwalk where we don't even need to go in there and deal with the alligators? Um, and I only can net, we can only band early on in the rookery season because the spoonbills tend to start nesting really earlier before the other species. Once the other species start hatching out and the chicks are bigger, then they could in theory start jumping out of the nest. So I don't wanna risk the other species. So we just band early on, usually um, in April. And we use super glue to keep it on. And they're adorable. They even have little baby spoons not long after they hatch. Uh, Spoonbill chicks are nested between two and two and a half weeks of age. The thing is though, spoonbills are asynchronous hatchers. So they start incubating their eggs from when the, when the first one was laid and they can lay eggs over the course of a week. So in one nest, you can have up to four chicks and, but they'd be a week apart from the youngest to the old one, oldest. So if they're less than two weeks of age, they're too small and the leg bands don't fit their legs and they can slip down. If they're older than two and a half weeks or closer to three weeks of age, they scramble and run away. And it's, they're not quite ready to do that, but they do that because they feel a predator's coming and it's too risky. So between two and two and a half weeks of age, they just kind of stare at you and you can grab them and they're the perfect size um, quickly, of course. And then we band them, pluck feathers to determine their sex and then uh, do a quick check and put them back. And so here's NR, a little bit older. This is N6T. So this is from two different years and two different nests. A little washed out. And I love this picture. <laughs> and that's all I have. Any questions? OK, so um, everyone at this time, um, we want to let the, the young birders ask the questions. So if there's adults, um, feel free to stay on, but we'd like them to ask. And I'm going to stop the recording.